in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, is a record of a military expedition involving three races of giants in the Elamites who were in control, an empire in control of Babylon, Sumer, Akkad, Mitanni, the Amorite, Amorite states, uh, northern Israel. And this military expedition's sole purpose was to wipe out a race of people, gigantic people who were mentioned in Genesis chapter 14. And it was a success. 35 centuries later, J.L. Porter discovered those cities. For a long time, there had been dis some disbelief, even among scholarship, biblical scholarship, because the 60 cities of Argob and the cities of Bashan had not been found. And yet, they were high in the mountains of Syria, and now they have been found. In 1860s, J.L. Porter actually went on site. And what he found is in a 400-page book called The Cities of Bashan. It is not his first book. But this is what archaics research does. We find these old books that are out of print. And we bring the information back to light. Because establishment historians today are silent about the gigantic architectural ruins that are found. A race of people, very advanced, had built cities of basalt and stone with doors frames and lintels all one stone piece we don't know how to do that today they're still standing F excerpts from that book are found throughout this video but the cities of bashan are interesting because the descendants of the anakim and Rephaim giants who built those cities that were found are mentioned later in the bible as the very giants that david and other heroes in the old testament fought Interesting video. This isn't really about Goliath, but it's about a race of giants that Goliath claimed descent from. Most of us know the story. David slew Goliath as both armies watched the giant fall unconscious from the blow of a single stone to his head. David ran and stood over the giant, picked up his great sword, and chopped off his head with it. The large sword, a relic of Israel, David again wielded 20 years later, and in 2 Samuel 21, 9, David is recorded to have looked upon the sword of Goliath and commented that there is none like that. Seeing their hero dead, the Philistines had fled. The story actually begins with David picking up five stones. The reason David initially picked up five stones instead of one is due to the presence of four other giants in the Philistine army. They were the direct sons of Goliath. At seeing the death of their father, David knew it was a possibility that these giants would try to immediately avenge their father's death. Before felling the giant, David told him that, For after your death, your three brothers too will fall by my hands. Now, now, why in the pseudo-philo text these other giants are called brothers when in the biblical passage, uh, passages referred to them as the sons of Goliath is not clear? But it is of interest to note that one of Goliath's sons is also called his brother in 2 Samuel 21 22. These sons of Goliath got their revenge later. After the prophet Samuel died, King Saul consulted the witch of Endor, who prophesied that his death was very imminent. At that time, the Philistines found him after hunting him and his sons when they fled from battle and killed Saul and Jonathan. David became king, and 20 years later, he defended Israel against the Philistines yet again, utterly defeating them and the four giants in their ranks. David fought with his soldiers against the Philistines on the battlefield, but he began to grow weary in battle when one of the sons of Goliath attacked him, thinking he had slain the Hebrew king. This giant was named Ishbibinab, and his spearhead weighed 12 and a half pounds, exactly half of that of his, of his father. But David was not killed, and the giant was immediately slain by the hero Abishai, one of David's personal guardians. The translation of giant in this passage is Rephaim, although it was an Anakim-related son of Goliath that dwelled among the Philistines. This greatly hints that somewhere in the misty past of the Nephilim, the Anakim and Rephaim were ancestrally linked with the Rephaim uh, uh, a 
of progenitors existing before the Anakim as evidenced by their earlier presence in the biblical narrative. Josephus, in his Antiquities, wrote that the giant was the son of Erath. This name confirms that Goliath was the, was the father because Erath is nothing more than another form of the word Rapha, which is giant, from which the word Rephaim derives. Deuteronomy 3.11 records that Og of Bashan was the last of the remnant of the Rephaims. Thus, it is probable that the Anakim could very well have descended from the Rephaim if Arba, who was the father of Anak himself according to the biblical text, was a Rephaim or had some family ties with them. In-depth study of the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, and the Emums might unveil other links to the Rephaim as well. All five of these are races of giants according to the book of Genesis. Another guardian of David was Sibachai, who slew a giant named Saph, another of the sons of Goliath. Again, the Philistines were met in bloody battle where another giant was slain, a son of Goliath, and was also his own brother. In 2 Samuel 21, 22, we read, And there was yet a battle at the city of Gath, where was a man of great stature, and he had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. This is evidence that incest was practiced among the Philistines, the Philistine Anakim, or at least done in secrecy, but the social acceptance of incestual relations in the Philistine culture is greatly alluded to in that this giant was also his brother, the brother of Goliath. Goliath having to have had maintained sexual contact with his own mother for this to have occurred, and the greatest proof lies in the fact that the unnamed third giant killed of the Philistine ranks was likewise, likewise a son of Goliath who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot and was a man of stupendous stature, a hideous giant mutant. Josephus wrote that this mutant giant vaunted himself to be one of the sons of the giants. Scripture records that he was six cubits tall. This would make him nine feet in height, nine inches shorter than Goliath, who stood at nine foot nine. The man who slew this Philistine monster was David's Hittite guardian, Sibachai. Josephus further notes that this Hittite warrior slew many of those that bragged that they were of the posterity of the giants. These four giants were killed by David and his soldiers 20 years after David picked up five stones to slay these people. This 2 Samuel 21 account of these four giants records that Goliath was a Gittite. This, had caught, this has caused much confusion, causing many to believe there lived two Goliaths, when in fact the title Gittite is an ethnic Philistine name for dweller at Gath. The fourth and last giant slain of Goliath's family was Lami, 2 Samuel 21, 19 and 22. This giant's name translates to simply warrior. The unnamed son of Goliath, the mutant with additional fingers and toes, provides light in our understanding of the dark plans of the adversary, the Demiurge. Having six fingers and toes was an unusual genetic mutation that suggests that incest was premeditated, calculated, because it had never been a secret to any people, past or present, the dangers involved in close inbreeding. This inbreeding was probably maintained by the Philistine ancestors of the Anakim to produce larger Philistine warriors, which is supported by the fact that Goliath laid with his own mother and the translation of Lame is warrior. With the death of this Philistine giant's son, the last giant in scripture had fallen. In fact, there are 12 giants specifically detailed in the Old Testament. These are listed with the translations of their names right here. Number one is Og, king of Bashan, the kingdom of Arba, Argob. His name means crooked. Two is Arba. He is the ancestral father of Anak. Uh, his, his, his name means Hero Baal or one of four. Interestingly, Anak was remembered in the ancient Ionian uh, annals as Anax. And there were many, many stories in the Greek records of ancient giants that were named Anax and Anaxum and Anaxa. Uh, as a matter of fact, Greek philosophers later, later took on the names of Anaximander and Anaxadrides in recognition of this ancestral line. The third one, Anak, Father of the Anakim, his name means long-necked or collared. The fourth is Sheshai, son of Anak. He, it means whitish or princely. The fifth is Talmai, son of Anak, which means furrowed or brave. 
Ahiman, son of Anak, is number six, brother of the right hand. The seventh is Goliath, Philistine giant. His name means exile, so he was from somewhere else. Ishbibinob, son of Goliath, means dweller at Nob. Number nine is Saf, son of Goliath. It means threshold, which is interesting because giants were normally placed in the old, old Bronze Age at the city gates. Number 10 is Lame, son of Goliath. It means warrior. Number 11 is the son and brother of Goliath. He is the unnamed mutant with extra fingers and toes. And the 12th is Rahab, a woman of Jericho. Her name means large or broad. All of these listed giants were either Rephaim or Anakim. Reflecting the translation of Anak, collar, we discover that Anakim is translated long neck, long neck. Og was a Rephaim, which means the dead, very tall. In some translations, it is unresurrected ones. The three Nephilim races not mentioned in this list are the Zuzums, the Zamzumums, and the Emums, because these giants were probably extinct long before Moses was even born. Zuzum means strong people, Zamzumum means noisy people, and Emums is translated to terrible people. Though the Zuzums were likely destroyed completely by Keto Laramore in the days of Abram, it is possible that they escaped him and later became the Zamzumums of ancient Ammon, according to the book of Deuteronomy 2.20. The sixth giant listed above is most unusual. His name, Ahiman, brother of the right hand, appears to be an ethnic title. Being a son of Anak in Hebron, Ahiman must have been truly heroic. His people were feared exceedingly and present a most unusual enigma to the historian. The ancient city of Mari on the Euphrates River northwest of Babylon was built around 1800 BC. This city is depicted in many old inscriptions from Babylonia and Assyria. Mari is described as, and by one ancient text, to have been the tenth city to be founded after the great cataclysm known to us as the Flood. The giant Ahiman lived in an Amorite society in southern Canaan, and it is possible that the larger Amorites were considered by the early Mesopotamians as being one and the same as the Anakim giants. An old, old text from this mysterious city discovered by archaeologists speak of fearsome invaders from the west called the Sons of the Right Hand. This title may have been attributed to all the sons of Anak because as far southwest as Egypt, the son of Anak named Talmai fathered a race of superhumans found on Egyptian monuments called the Tamahu. This Egyptian name contains the Amorite god Amuru, or Westerner. These old mythology books are fantastic. You never know what you find in them. My library is absolutely packed with all different renditions of mythology and traditional books from all around the world. Some of them are in French and German. Most of them are in English. But it's not the text. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's not really what they're saying. It's these, the, the pictures. This book is gigantic. The index is fantastic. I looked up giants. There's just too much, there's just too much to see. It's just, these old books have absolutely tremendous amount of data about the ancient world. I, I live in these books. I study them, I data mine them, they're just fantastic. It's where Archaics gets a lot of its data from most books that people just don't have the time to read, our lives are very busy, this is very well understood. The ancient official version from numerous Dead Sea texts, the Hatteroth writings, and rabbinical, apocryphal, and pseudepigraphical collections is that the sons of God descended in ancient times from the sky, impregnated human females, were cursed as rebellious after their progeny had become gigantic, caused wars, cannibalism, and the Creator destroyed the world in a flood to rid the problem. The version is entirely Jewish. However, the existence of giants in antiquity was an old world fact widely recognized, as well as the cataclysm that was recorded later as the Great Flood. We have all read the Genesis passage on giants before the flood. It reads, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, Men of Renown, Genesis 6-4.
we will we will begin with some little well-known references to giants in the book of Barak 3 26 through 28 we read here in early times the famous giants were born a mighty race skilled in war but God did not choose them to be his people or show them the way of knowledge they died out because they had neither understanding nor insight in antiquities of the Jews Flavius Josephus wrote 2,000 years ago, Many angels of God accompanied women and begat sons that proved unjust and despised all that was good on account of their strength. These men did resemble the acts of those the Grecians called giants. There was till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different than other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are shown to this very day. Among the artifacts of literature found near the Quamrum area, the Dead Sea Scrolls Caves, is an old sermon about the flood and those it drowned. Although only partially translated from its fragments, it reads as follows, quote, so were they destroyed by the flood, every one of them perishing in the water, for they had disobeyed the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, all on dry land were blotted out, man and beast, bird and winged creature, all died in the cataclysm. Not even the giants escaped. Unquote. In the Jubilees text of the 2nd century BC, a rabbinical Jewish literature, the writer reveals that the flood was a direct result of the sins of angels and their giant offspring. In Jubilee 7, 14 through 25, we read, For on account of these three the flood came upon the earth, for it was because of the fornication which the watchers, apart from the mandate of their authority, fornicated with the daughters of men, and took for themselves wise, wives from all that they chose, and made a beginning of impurity. And they begot sons, the Naphidim, and all of them were dissimilar, and each one ate his fellow. Hmm cannibalism. When the Torah was written, Hebrew was in its purest form. From that time, Moses began putting the scriptures into writing by the inspiration of God according to the narrative until Jubilees was written past almost 1300 years. Enough time for the original Hebrew to become polluted from the many exiles of the Jews. The 70 year captivity of Israel in Babylon ultimately caused the corruption of Hebrew. At least this is the rabbinical version. The name Naphedon in the Hebrews account is no different than Nephilim, the fallen ones of the biblical text in Genesis. It is only an alteration of the pure Hebrew with possibly Babylonian or Aramaic influence. The final statement that each one ate his fellow implies that the Nephilim indulged in cannibalism. This strange practice is further detailed in the Book of Enoch, also extracted from the Dead Sea text, where is found the title Watchers, the angels that originally sinned. So the giants turned against the people in order to eat them, and they began to sin against birds, wild beasts, reptiles, and fish, and their flesh was devoured the one by the other, and they drank blood. And then the earth brought an accusation against the oppressors. Enoch 7, 11-15 The writers of Enoch and those of the Jubilees and Jasher accounts called the Book of the Upright support the biblical text concerning the impregnation of earthly women by angels. The Enochian text reads, quote, And they conceived... And they conceiving brought forth giants. These devoured all which the labor of men produced, until it became impossible to feed them, when they turned themselves against men in order to devour them. Enoch 7, 11-13. Enoch 12, 4 reads, From these and other old traditions we gather that the Nephilim had enslaved men, and that mankind sought deliverance from a, from a man rather than the Creator. Enoch is shown in Jasher to be a mighty ruler, highly esteemed by both men and angels. The watchers called me Enoch the scribe. In the book of Giants, the Nephilim assembled and begged Enoch to make intercession between them and God. So many women began having giant children that the angels themselves knew their judgment was impending. To counter the advances of the sexually oppressive angels, it is revealed in the book of the upright that some of the sons of men caused their wives to drink a draught to render them barren. In the writings of Enoch, God declares that the giant shall hope for eternal life and that each will each may live, each of them five hundred years. This is in Enoch ten fourteen. 
This futile hope of the Giants is deeply reflected in the Epic of Gilgamesh. This mysterious and very physically powerful king of Uruk is a, is a giant, part god, that strives throughout the Epic to gain immortality, but in the end he dies just as the other giants die. In fact, Gilgamesh is named in the Enoch Enochian Book of Giants that was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. According to Haley's Bible Handbook, the cities of Eridu, Obed, Kish, and Ur had been built before the Flood, with Ur of the Chaldees being excavated by ancient pre-Babylonian people and rebuilt. In this Chaldean city were discovered golden plates that read, Gods in the form of men came down. Turning now to extra-canonical books of the Dead Sea text, we will peer into the Damascus document. Originally found at the beginning of the century by a Jewish scholar at Geniza, it was originally published under the title Zadokite Fragment. However, the ancient text was later discovered again in Caves 4 and 5 of the Dead Sea. It was then retitled to the Damascus document, and it reads, quote, When they went about in their willful heart, the guardian angels of heaven fell and were ensnared by it, for they did not observe the commandments of God. Their sons, who were as tall as cedars, and whose bodies were as big as mountains, fell by it. Everything mortal on dry land expired and became as it had never existed. This is a reference to the cataclysm, referred to in Genesis as the Great Flood. The Damascus document provides us further support in our endeavor here to understand the pre-flood giants, but the most incredible text ever discovered concerning the original Nephilim that plagued the earth before the flood was likewise excavated among the Dead Sea site, and is simply titled The Book of Giants. Formerly only found in the Ethiopic language, the Book of Enoch was also discovered in the Aramaic language among the Dead Sea Scrolls, but also discovered with Enoch was a previously unknown section called the Book of Giants. The badly preserved text is severely fragmented, but it is not difficult to understand that it tells of the Dark Angel Azazel and the descent of fallen angels that knew great and wondrous secrets murdered many people, corrupted the animal kingdoms, created monsters and giants, polluted earth and sinned against gods and God and men. The giants left behind by the disobedient angels began having dreams and nightmares of an impending calamity until they sent one of their own to inquire of the holy mortal Enoch, who interpreted their dreams as meaning that a great flood would come and drown the races of giants in the evil works their angelic fathers had performed. Though copies of the Book of Enoch exist in the Ethiopic language outside the Dead Sea discoveries, the Enochian Book of Giants is a formerly unknown section of these ancient writings exclusively found in the Quorum site. A portion of the, of the Book of Giants reads, Oya declared and said unto the giants, I too had this dream, O giants, and behold, the ruler of heaven came down to this earth, and such is the end of my dream. All the giants and monsters grew afraid and called Mawe. He came to them, and the giants pleaded with him and sent him to Enoch. How long the giants have to live. Another Dead Sea text titled The Book of Wisdom reads that, For even in the beginning, when arrogant giants were perishing, the hope of the world took refuge on a raft. In another widely disregarded text in the apocryphal book of 3rd Maccabees, where in 2.4 we read the giants were long ago destroyed in a flood. Peter had obviously arduously studied the Old Testament records and many others that have been lost since, and even received further uh, revelations from the Spirit concerning the sons of God and their sins in early history, for he provides us today a wealth of information about these subjects in his New Testament writings. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The angels that sinned are the sons of God in the days of Noah, who took the daughters of men, who in turn begat giants that wreaked havoc on man and introduced unprecedented evils which resulted in a flood upon the world of the ungodly. The, the word hell in verse 4 should read Tartarus. This is the only place in the Bible where Tartarus is found in its verbal form. The spiritual prison is completely separated from Gehenna, Sheol, Hades, and Hell. It could very well be a reference to the abyss, the bottomless pit. Some believe the gates of Tartarus are located beneath the guardian cherub that covereth, the Sphinx at Giza. 
Even the silent apostle Jude concedes with Peter concerning the dark history of the Nephilim, even identifying their angelic fathers as wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude 13. Here in Beowulf, the Nephilim Slayer. We find that giants are the most common and thoroughly ignored presence in the vast majority of ancient literature. From the 4,000-year-old Epic of Gilgamesh to the late 1,000-year-old poem Beowulf, giants are discovered in fascinating accuracy when compared to the biblical accounts of the Nephilim. Between these two historic epics are the famous Homeric epics, epics called the Odyssey and the Iliad. Both extremely lengthy stories about gods and giants that archaeologists and historians marvel over even today. The Roman poet and writer Virgil continued this art form of epic preservation in his articulate collection called the Aeneid, and his contemporary in the first, B first century BC named Ovid also wrote about giants and their conflicts with the gods and the mortals. The subject of giants is in the Book of Giants recorded in the Book of Enoch as well. It is in the epic poem titled Beowulf that we learn the most stunning and intricate insights into giant history and beliefs. This ancient poem was truly preserved by a miracle, for only one burnt copy of the thousand-year-old epic remains, and it is located today in the British Museum. Under the Catholic Inquisition, all known copies of Beowulf were burnt and their owners severely punished. Long ago, as far back as a few decades after the Great Deluge in 2239 BC that collapsed the old Bronze Age civilizations, bards and sages would tell stories weaving their history into a poetic cadence, often using harps or other instruments for effect and entertainment. Entire stories, line by line, were memorized and told with great effect. Later, these traditions passed from being solely oral to written epics that preserve the human experience and beliefs people maintained in artistic forms that earn their tellers high esteem and a very good living among the people. Even today, these poems are hauntingly vivid, despite that their translations no longer have the effect of rhythm. Like the power experienced within the pages of our most spiritual writings, these ancient epics echo of times magically familiar to us deep within our being. A modern writer, William Cooper, has put together a very scholarly and convincing argument for the historicity of the ancient Old English poem, Beowulf, identifying names in the poem in archaic Danish and Anglo-Saxon genealogies, including the Geatish warrior Beowulf himself. This research is found in William Cooper's book titled After the Flood, a fascinating and new look at ancient and modern Anglo-Saxon history. I recommend this book to anyone who wants to know this type of material. It is an awesome read. The Anglo-Saxon race, along with the Geats, Swedes, Gauls, Norse, Celts, the Scythians, among others of European ancestry, are all more recent descendants of the people who trace their bloodlines directly back to Mesopotamia, to the patriarchs, Japheth, and to Noah, the survivor of the flood, the Atnapishtim of the Sumerian epics. The Norse remember the giants as enemies of the gods, evil frost giants that terrorized their ancestors during a cold ice age epic long ago. The Celts recorded their battles with the last Ferrobogs and the Fomorian giants and then the later Tuatha de Danan, all huge and violent people. And now, in Beowulf, is discovered a knowledge of evil giants by the ancient Danish and Gittish people. The author of this famous poem is no longer known, lost in the mist of history and Catholic oppression, but his belief in the existence of giants and their biblical history is unquestionable. In Burton Raffles' creative translation of Beowulf, we read of the Grendel. He was spawned in that slime, conceived by a pair of those monsters born of Cain, murderous creatures banished by God, punished forever for the crime of Abel's death. The Almighty drove those demons out, and their exile was bitter. Shut away from men, they split into a thousand forms of evil spirits, and fiends, and goblins, monsters, giants, a brood forever opposing the Lord's will, and again and again defeated. Very dramatic is Raffles' translation, artistic. It's also, it's also worth a read. The belief of old that giants and demons are one and the same has incredibly ancient origins. The writings of Enoch, another epic-like collection of stories 
revelations and prophecies concerning angels and giants confirms this connection long ago. The book of Enoch explains that when giants die, evil spirits shall pro proceed from their flesh because they were created from above. From the holy watchers was their beginning. Evil spirits shall they be upon the earth, and the spirits of the wicked shall they be called. The famous John Milton reflects this archaic belief in his modern epic of the 17th century titled Paradise Lost, in which we read that the original fallen angels became fairies, having sons of enormous stature long ago that in more contemporary times have become diminutive. William Cooper's genealogy of the royal Geetish house has Beowulf living at about A.D. 495 to 583, 15 centuries ago. The members of Beowulf's family and ancestors as listed in the poem are also discovered in the genealogy and traced directly back to the flood survivor by ancient chroniclers such as Geoffrey of Monmouth in his historic History of the Kings of Britain. Having a definitive place in northern European history, the writings in Beowulf thus strengthen the writings of Enoch concerning the giants and their demonic relations. Concerning Beowulf, Dr. Paul Karras wrote in his own book, The History of the Devil and the Idea of Evil. There are innumerable legends which preserve the old conception and simply replace the names of giants by demons. The entire plot of Beowulf epic concerns these giants. Already by the time of the saga, the giants were no longer existing as a civilization. Beowulf traveled to help the Danes kill Grendel, a fierce beast that haunted the fens and swampy moors. Before his famous stand against the creature, he boasted, I drove five great giants into chains. I chased all that race from the earth. Here is evidence that the early Anglo-Saxon people regarded the giants as a race and not regarded as random mutations caused by inbreeding. This is not unusual and nor would it have been contended by the first millennium BC Britons, the Celts, and Norse, all, all who incidentally traced their ancestry to post-cataclysm patriarchs who had lived long ago when giants were a much more common threat. Beowulf kills a monster called Grendel, a beast that lived among reptilian creatures with sharp claws and teeth. William Cooper cites evidence and provides photographs of archaeological relics of stone and clay figurines of prehistoric-like creatures. We call them today dinosaurs. In his book, After the Flood, he reveals astonishing historical proofs and records of these and other creatures now extinct that evidently lived in the swamps and lakes of Europe over a thousand years ago. A complete list of 71 zoologically applied terms in Beowulf is in this fascinating book. After the defeat of Grendel in a wrestling match where Beowulf tore off the monster's arm, bards immediately composed songs and poems of Beowulf's bravery, weaving their lyrics into older songs about heroes even further back in time. The unknown narrator states, there were tales of giants wiped from the earth by Sigmund's might. The writer of the poem describes the verses of Sigmund as being from old songs, revealing that the giants were a part of their distant history. After Beowulf, Beowulf killed Grendel, the monster's mother ate a Danish warrior in King Hrothgar's renovated hall, beginning her revenge. One of Beowulf's soldiers was eaten the next night as well. Beowulf meets the fog giant Grendel and defeats him. He then encounters Grendel's mother, the giantess of the marsh, whence the fog rises, according to Burton Raffle. Traced back to early Britain, we find many parallels concerning the giants in Beowulf and the giant remnants, the hill giants, the mountain giants, the storm and fog giants, all related to the ancient furbolgs and the Fomorians. In Bullfinch's mythology are found huge mountain giants applied to the frost giants that warred against the Norse gods. Grendel is also described as being a very large in Time Life Books collection called the Enchanted World, Night Creatures, where we read, although manlike, that being was no man, huge and hairy, it shambled through the night mists of fell and fen. Beowulf hunted the mother of Grendel, a female giant, in a swamp and found her among the ruins of an ancient hall that the creature was using for a lair, his own sword useless against the she-beast. 
Beowulf wrestles her as he had done her son. Unlike any woman today, this monster had incredible strength and pinned Beowulf to the stone floor of the dilapidated building. In the epic we read, squatting with her weight on his stomach, she drew a dagger, brown with dried blood, and prepared to avenge her only son. Beowulf had entered the swamp with the mindset of defeating the giant without a weapon, as he had done her son, or so he had boasted. But during the unique conflict, Beowulf frees himself from her grasp and sees, in the epic, hanging on the wall, a heavy sword, hammered by giants, strong and blessed with their magic, the best of all weapons, but so massive that no ordinary man could lift its carved and decorated length. This passage calls to mind the many citations and old stories concerning the metallurgical practices of the giants, of the Anakim of the Old Testament, and the Anunnaki of the Babylonian Antiquity, both of which have their name derived from ancient words for metals. These giants mined rare and precious metals and were smiths that incorporated vast intelligence, alchemy, and adept metallurgical skills into their weaponry. Today, people regard giants as being clumsy, unintelligent, and, and mythical, but, no, but not long ago, they were perceived as agile, malicious, to be feared, highly skilled, and their workmanship was like magic. After slaying Grendel's mother in the ruins, the hero returned, and in the epic we read, but all that Beowulf took was Grendel's head and the hilt of the giant's jeweled sword. Grendel was not a single creature, but the name of mysterious giants known to hide in the swamplands away from human civilization. The Beowulf epic makes careful mention of other monsters, great beasts that fit perfectly in today's versions of prehistoric creatures. Grendel was personified as a demon by the author of Beowulf. Being an early Christian writer, this is not unusual. However, the word Grendel was used in the English transliterations to describe such phrases as terrifying ugly one, solitary walker, terrible, evildoer, devil, a cursed outcast, fierce in battle, and giant. The word for giant is actually found in line 426 of the epic. It's fierce, which refers to the male Grendel Beowulf killed first. The Fomorians, the ancient Irish giants of old, were hideous in appearance and could easily be described as terrifying ugly ones. Since no good giants are found in scripture, it is not surprising that giants have been universally associated with the devil and evil doing by scores of historical texts and traditions. The description of Grendel being terrible fits perfectly with the biblical giants called Emims in the Old Testament, for terrible is the translation of Emim. All the, all the giant nations of the Old Testament, the Anakim, the Rephaim, the Emims, the Zamzums, the Zuzums, were warlike, fierce in battle. No Nephilim people ever knew peace. In the Beowulf text, we discover that Grendel is described to walk like a man, an attribute very rare, save for humans. This proves Grendel was no ordinary monster. Speaking to Beowulf, King Hrothgar said, I've heard that my people, peasants working in the fields, have seen a pair of such fiends wandering in the moors and marshes, giant monsters living in those desert lands. And they said to my wise men that, as well as they could see, one of the devils was a female creature. The other, they say, walked through the wilderness like a man, but mightier than any man. This description of the beast gives forth the image of a giant humanoid creature. In Beowulf it appears that the Grendel beasts slain by the hero were giants that lived in some ancient ruins in a swamp. After slaying the first Grendel, the first Grendel's mother, Beowulf then decapitated her and carried that terrible trophy by the hair. Admittedly, Beowulf had killed giants before, but this Grendel was the first giantess he had ever slain. If these Grendel beasts were descended from ancient Nephilim giants, then they would have been intelligent. The giants were forgers and metallurgical masters that they definitely retained the intelligence to have, to have had a written language in their past. Here, in this archaic Old English poem, is found astonishing historical accuracy in what is regarded today by the intellectual elite as a mere myth. Beowulf used a mighty old sword to kill the giantess in the ruined hall where Grendel dwelt. The epic reads, he gave the golden sword hilt to Hrothgar, 
who held it in his wrinkled hands and stared at what giants had made and monsters owned. It was his now, an ancient weapon shaped by wonderful smiths. This inspiring rendition by Burton Raffle calls to mind the biblical stories of trophies kept in remember kept in remembrance of the giant so popular in Bible history, where the giant king named Og was killed and his thirteen and a half foot long bed was kept as a trophy by the Ammonites. And then David killed Goliath with his own giant sword after knocking the Philistine giant unconscious with the stone. The sword of Goliath was kept in a temple and many years later was wielded by David again. In the epic we read, The old king bent close to the handle of the ancient relic and saw written there the story of ancient wars between good and evil, the opening of the waters, the flood sweeping away giants, how they suffered and died, that race who hated the ruler of us all and received judgment from his hands, surging waves that found them wherever they fled, and King Hrothgar saw runic letters clearly carved in that shining hilt, spelling its original owner's name. This enormous sword given to King Hrothgar of the Danes was called an ancient relic almost 1,500 years ago. The Sumerians and Akkadians of Babylonia remembered the smith giants of old, calling them Anunnaki and Anakim and Anuna. Goliath was a descendant of the Anakims that fled Canaan and found refuge in Philistia away from the conquests and bloody campaigns of Joshua and the invading Israelites. When David killed Goliath, he took the giant's sword as a trophy of his feat as Beowulf had done also. Both heroes also gave these relics away. The amazing aspect of this giant sword hilt is the runic letters. The runes were used only by initiates in the Celtic mysteries in the Druidic worship and practices, and Celts and Druidic beliefs migrated from Greater Canaan and ultimately from the regions of Chaldea and Mesopotamia through Ionia. The runes were called moon letters long ago, specially imprinted with light wax, invisible unless held up to the moon or candle to be read through the paper, the thin vellum, or parchment. Runes developed from the ancient Akkadian cuneiform letters, crescent-shaped letters resembling little moons. Remarkably, Chaldea, the nation, is translated the moon. This runic inscription upon the hilt of the sword was probably inscribed by the Tuatha Dé people, enormous in stature, and from Canaan that somehow ended up in the Epic of Beowulf. Like Beowulf of the Anglo-Saxons, a hero lived long ago among the Sumerians, Babylonians, and Akkadians named Gilgamesh. And not unlike Beowulf, this royal figure has been identified as being a real person of distant antiquity, the king of biblical Erech, in the Sumerian records called Uruk, and in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Also, just as the Gitish hero slew a giant at the edges of human civilization, Gilgamesh first killed a giant much larger than himself, even though he himself was of partial giant ancestry. The giant slain by the Sumerian hero was named Humbawa, the guardian of the cedar forest. Like the Philistine Anakim giant Goliath in the Old Testament, we discover that Humbawa, the giant, had a sword of eight talents. As David kept Goliath's sword and Beowulf the giant sword hilt of Grendel, Gilgamesh took this enormous sword as well. The fact that Humbawa was a giant guardian conveys that he was keeping post for others or, or keeping post for something of value, and this is what is discovered by Gilgamesh. For after slaying the giant Humbawa, the Sumerian hero then came across the sacred dwellings of the Anunnaki. Gilgamesh had traveled from the far west. He ended up in the, among the cedars of Lebanon. He came across a giant that protected a sacred area that was the dwellings of the Anunnaki. My own personal interpretation is far is far variant from the scholars. I don't see a myth, a traditionalized story that was created about a hero. What I see is a cover story of a hero who came across the giant sphinx which protected a, sa a, a sanctuary that was later discovered to be the architecture of the Anunnaki. But that's for another video.
Hey, this is Jason with Archaics.com. I'm on 2296 heading north to Highway 190. I'm getting beat up right now by all this rain. Well, we got a video to do, something that's going to really interest you. I hope you can hear me. I'm talking extra loud. Between the van, this rough road, this wind and rainstorm, cool front coming through Texas. Imagine that, August. I've been needing it too, man, because I've been working in 100 degree blistering heat. I lost three guys in the past two weeks behind that heat. It's just not going to work. I don't blame them. Because I got bills to pay. I don't have a choice. I got to do it. But I got an awesome video right here. What makes the video so good and unique is that five minutes ago I had no idea I was going to do it. I didn't know. Something just passed through my mind and I realized it's a topic that I haven't covered. But it's one that I need to cover. Alright, I'm leaving Highway 75 and I'm turning right on 2296 right now. I love these state highways. They're all 70 degrees. They're all, they're all 70 miles an hour. And we all go 90. Takes it so big, they don't, nobody cares. <clears throat> Alright, now I'm safe. Got my, didn't miss my turn. Okay, I've often told you guys about the vapor canopy. When the vapor canopy collapsed, it caused the Great Flood. During the vapor canopy world, things were fundamentally different. But I haven't really described to you what happened just after the collapse and how the vapor canopy collapse answers for us one of the greatest mysteries of the ancient world. That mystery has been, it has been broached by me. I've mentioned it, but I've given no details. Every single person who's ever studied the ancient literature of the world, can they cannot refute the statement I'm about to make. This statement is very simple. All of the oldest writings in the world, no matter where, what culture they come from, have a single common denominator that you can't refute. The subject matter, or at least a lot of the contents of those tablets and those writings and traditions, all involve giants. But they also involve another element that the Greek traditions weigh heavily on. And that is the difference between Titans and giants. I can't believe how slow we're going. I'm going 22 miles an hour. Oh, oh, somebody's making a right turn and they're taking forever to do it. The difference between Titans and Giants has always been a mystery. Most people never really thought there was much of a difference. They're both gigantic people. But there is a fundamental difference, and it lies in the historical record. We can answer this from the very traditions that we have interpreted. Now, granted, very few people are as advanced in this forward way of thinking as I, because they're so compartmentalized, and they only specialize in their own branch of historic study. Whereas I, I have defied all compartmentalization and I take it all in. And the only way you can really accurately interpret any pieces of the whole is to study the whole. And that's taken a lifetime to do. And it took 26 years of me being in a Texas prison cell studying all these old mythological and historic and archaeological records for me to piece all this together. But once it was pieced together and I cited my source materials, nobody can refute it. It's all there. It's been there all along. Just somebody needed to put it together. So, you no. Know, I wasn't out there. I wasn't out in the free world going to coffee shops and Starbucks and chasing tails and spending time on the internet. And, I, I mean, I never even been on the internet until 2016 when I got out of prison. So, a lifetime of going to work and taking care of your family. A lifetime of doing all these things that we take for granted. I didn't do that. I was sitting in a prison cell 24 hours a day reading books. So this video, this video is going to be very beneficial to you. Because you don't have to go to prison to learn this. You got it from me. I've already done it for you. Enjoy the video. But this is what happens immediately after the vapor canopy collapsed in May of 2239 BC. And why the world before the flood was over. And the world after the flood was the age of heroes. It's very unique. This is Jason of Archaics.com. The difference between Titans and Giants.
trying to wait this rain out, but it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Now, every single human alive that was born before the vapor canopy collapsed was born, they, they were genetically adapted and modified to live in an, in an environment that was conducive to the vapor canopy ecology. The ecosphere was fundamentally different. They could, they could, they could hold their breath for long periods of time underwater. Uh, they could run farther. They didn't need as much oxygen. Uh, it was just, they grew to astonishing size as human, human skeletons have been found anatomically correct 12 feet tall. When I say giants, I am not talking about that bullshit Facebook version where you see these 90 foot tall cartoons of giants represented next to next to 20 foot taller giants for later and then common man that's facebook facebook scholars kill me they really do man but anyway the people born before the flood the rain is lightened up a little bit the people born before the flood were genetically were, were very genetically different they look the same but when the vapor canopy collapsed, we have a phenomenon. We have a world full of survivors. The story of Noah surviving with just seven other people is bullshit. It's a Jewish rendition of older, of older Semitic traditions that were found among the Amorite dynasty, uh, uh, the dynastic records that were found in Babylon, and it's just all untrue. It's just one single tradition of hundreds of blood traditions that have survived, and the Jews turned it into a. A, a Genesis account where only eight people survived and they just happened to be the ancestors of the Jews. So it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. There were survivors in pockets of colonies of survivors all over the fucking world. Now, infrastructures collapsed. Whole navies were separated from their host nations. Colonies now had to become whole countries because there was no way back to where they were gone. The, top, the topography of the world had changed. I'm not going to go into those destructions. I have given so many videos on what happened at the Great Flood and the Phoenix Reset, all that. I'm not, it's not the subject of this video. Take it for granted that if you've never heard any of my videos before, I have about 40 videos that describe this one destruction in May of 2239 BC. And I'm backed up by a consortium of over 40 scientific geologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, who all in 1998 asserted that yes, in the year 2240 or thereabout, the entire world was destroyed and only two people survived. So I am making this up. All the chronologies of the ancient world point to 2239 BC, and, and we're just going to leave it at that. So that's when it happened. Vapor canopy collapsed. When the vapor canopy collapsed, all of a sudden these, these, these survivors, to them, the sun was born. Because during the vapor canopy world, there was no sun. The moon was seen every night very clearly. Because in a vapor canopy atmosphere, during the daytime when the sun is up, there is a, there is a very thick, grayish, green, uh, like aquamarine cloud canopy between the sun and the ground. But all that water in the sky, as the sun goes down, returns back to the earth. This is why Genesis says that every evening and every morning, a dew watered all the land, and there was no such thing as rain. Genesis is absolutely correct. There was no rain. There is no rain needed in a vapor canopy world because the vapor canopy goes up and down. At nighttime, the vapor canopy comes down, and it tables all over the land. It waters all the herbage, it waters everything, it fills ponds. Uh, there's already lakes and ponds and rivers. And then, but, the, but, but what it really does is when it comes down at night, because it cools at night, during the vapor canopy world, the stars are brilliant, but there's still a mesosphere of liquid in, in, in our atmosphere that magnifies the heavens. Now you can see far away. The, the, at, the, 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 uh, the dome-like atmosphere is, it's a, it's a concave it's a concave lens and it's magnifying everything that people see and they think those stars and those planets and those objects that they're studying are very close and this is why astronomy in the ancient world was so meticulous and very advanced but later it fell into disrepute the reason it fell into disrepute is because the vapor canopy collapsed and at nighttime when the vapor canopy was no longer there during the daytime there was a sun during the daytime, there was clouds. The rainbow appeared. Even Jesus says it was the first time the rainbow appeared. But Jesus paints it as a covenant between, between God and man that he would never destroy the world like that again. Well, truth be told, 
Although y'all know I'm not a Christian, I do value the biblical records as accurate source materials for a lot for a lot of it, except for the Jewish, re, you know, uh, redacted or, uh, areas of the scriptures that paint them as God's chosen people and everybody else is basically cattle. Uh, I totally disagree with all, all those statements. But then again, they're not in the oldest text anyway; they're just Jewish redactions. So, oh yeah, the weather is so much better now. Although there are some evil-looking clouds up there, I gotta watch out. I gotta watch out in this area because. Tornadoes come ripping through here all the time. I'm way in the middle of nowhere. If any of you want to Google 2296 and 190, that's where I'm at right now. I am turning right on Highway 190. I'm going to pass over Lake Livingstone, two bridges. Y'all seen those, those bridges in my videos before. I still got a ways to go to get there. But I am now stopped on, 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 on a Farm Road 2296. It's raining. We have a cool front. I can already tell the temperature difference. It's awesome. So this is this is very intriguing. When the vapor canopy collapsed, ice walls appeared around the 45 degree north parallel and the 45 degree, degree south parallel. These ice walls appeared frozen fucking solid. The, I'm, we're talking about animals were frozen solid. They've been found. This isn't theoretical. They've been found. Megafauna have been found perfectly preserved. I'm talking about their hides, their coats, tulips undecomposed, still on their tongues, tongues frozen solid. We're talking about 3.5 million specimens have been found from North America, Canada, Siberia, Northern Russia, and Northern China. This is, I'm not, I, I don't have to make this up. This is, it's, 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 it's well established. And it was well established before World War I. In the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, there were there were indigenous peoples in Siberia that were thawing out the permafrost. And when they thawed out the permafrost, they would take out these gigantic mammoths, these mastodons, woolly rhinos, three-toed sloths, and they would sit there and defrost them near their fires. Then they would chop them up and they would cook them. And in 1880, the meat was still good. That's right, that's right. They were flash frozen. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the phenomenon of flash frozen, it's a Phoenix phenomenon. It's one of the things that the Phoenix weapon does. It can flash fro it can flash freeze whole biosphere. I have videos that show absolute documented proof that many organisms on this planet have been flash frozen. Because you cannot, you cannot petrify dragonfly wings. You cannot take earthworms and, and turn them into a fossil. It's impossible. They're invertebrates. The uniformitarian view of our world is absolute bullshit, and I tell you guys this over and over and over and over. I still have many of you evolutionary believing bastards listening to my channel, and that's okay. You know what I mean? I forgive you, man, because you, you just haven't had access to all the data that I have. And I get that. I do. But if you can't explain to me how you fossilize a jellyfish or find over 5,000 specimens of fossilized jellyfish, then really you've got no business believing what you believe. Evolution, uniformitarianism, evolution, all that crap. Long geologic, now fossils are created in seconds. It doesn't take millions of years. Now, having said that, when the vapor canopy collapsed, we have the collision of two ecospheres. All of a sudden, the sun appears and it's hot. It's hot, but it's hot around the 30 degree belt of the equator. This is also called, and you can Google this, you can always fact check me guys. I, don't, I have no problem being fact checked. But you can also call this the pyramid belt because the pyramid belt is also 30 degrees north latitude, 30 degrees south latitude. It's within a 60 degree band of our equator. All around the world, it's called the pyramid belt. That's where all these pyramids are found, hundreds of them. Now, and remember, the Great Pyramid is exactly 30 degrees north latitude and 30 degrees e e east meridian. So, east of the meridian. So, it's, it's, it's uniquely placed also, but it's within the pyramid belt. Where all these civilizations appeared after the vapor canopy collapse, you know of, is after the flood, and they, uh, and they started building, rebuilding their civilizations. But this time, they knew the importance of the pyramid. And I have videos on that too. The Similicum Chronicles, listen to them, tell you all about why those pyramids were built. Now, when the vapor canopy collapsed, humans didn't stop reproducing. There were women who were pregnant in May. In, I mean, there was hundreds of thousands of women that survived that were pregnant during the time of May when the Phoenix phenomenon occurred. 
these babies are still enjoying the 100% pre-vapor canopy collapse genome. The genome was very different for humans. There are there are there are whole gene there are whole ge latent gene sequences that have been turned off because the vapor canopy world is gone. But it took a few generations, and the, herein lies our problem. Immediately after the flood, we have just regular humans. These humans didn't see themselves as giants. They didn't see themselves as titans. They saw themselves as ordinary. They saw no threat in the birth of their children, which was they very soon found out were much smaller in stature. 100 years after the flood, and we have the traditions that support this. We have fragments in the Testament of Amram. We have fragments found throughout the Nag Hammadi text and the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Jewish Haggadah. The Talmud is full of references, and so are many traditions. Robert Graves has preserved many of them in his books. All his books are like six, 700 pages long. Really boring, really boring text on all the traditions, but they're necessary if you're going to get down to the foundations of truth about the world of old. So I read them, and I data mined them, and I found all these awesome glimpses into our ancient past. The titans are the normal humans who survived the vapor canopy collapse. They're the humans that were living in the world before the flood. These people lived for two and three hundred years, no problem. They lived in a technologically advanced society. We've, we found their monuments, we found the evidence, we found human skeletons with bullet holes in them. I haven't even addressed those, I haven't even pulled those notes out yet. I have notes to show you guys where anthropologists and archaeologists, they won't say bullet holes. They won't say it. But we have found animal skulls pelvic bones and human skulls that show perfect evidence of bullet holes going through their deals. And it wasn't slings. We're talking about high velocity rounds that penetrated skulls and bones and, and people were hunting back then. And they were hunting each other. Or oh, this war. We'll get to those. I found those in the writings of David Hatcher Childers and, and several other very interesting archaeological books. But I digress. When the vapor canopy world ended, we had just a normal human civilization. They didn't know by their standards that they would be considered giants or titans. But a hundred years later, normal humans were being born. And they were less than twice the height. This is why all the oldest traditions of Diana, of Ephesus, and many other Greek goddesses like Aphrodite, shows that their male worshippers were always up to their navel. These females were huge, but by our standards, not by theirs. They were absolutely normal. But after the flood, people stopped growing to these huge, huge, but they couldn't. The biosphere wouldn't let them. Our genome was completely altered and, and, and new gene sequences opened, other ones closed off. Uh, synaptic fail safes were activated, some of them, some of them remain open. And these people realized, holy shit, we're like gods to our own offspring. Not only in height, but even when by the time that Lugal, Lugal Banda, who was one of the big men of Sumer, see the Sumerians separated their society between those who were big men, gigantic people, and those who were ordinary people. But the Sumerians never said that the big people or the little people weren't people. They just recognized there was a huge difference in their status and their size, but they looked identical. The Sumerians called them the Lugals. They were Lugalim. Lugal just meant big men, the big, the people of the big men. These people were peaceful. They were like shepherds. They protected the smaller people. They were not scared of the predatory animals. And by the time Lugal Banda had a son named Lugal Merid, who Lugal Merid became famous. Lugal Merid is one of the most famous people who has ever ever been written about in ancient records. Lugal Merid in Sumer grew up and became one well, of his ruling title was Amar Udaak. Amar Udaak is better remembered in the Akkadian as Merodak. But by the time of Babylon, when the priests were scrubbing the histories and rewriting all this stuff, 
so you and I wouldn't know it. His new name was Marduk. When the Jews read all these histories and they realized they recorded the life of Marduk, Amar Udaak, Merodak, Lugor Merod, Lugo, uh, Lugo Merod, they recorded them all and they, because he's all one person. <coughs> the Jews did a really good job of taking all these histories and putting it into a chronological format and their chronology is impeccable. They even exactly dated the exact year the vapor canopy collapsed. But you have to understand, the Jews preserved only what they had already found in old Amorite libraries. They hated the Amorites. We call those people the Israelites, but they hated them with a passion. They still hate They still hate the Israelites and their descendants today. This is why the media lies to you every day. This is why all the world is the way it is, because these people are still conducting warfare against the descendants of the Amuru. But well, we'll get to that. That's another, video. That's another series of videos. So, the person that the person is named Nimrod. Many of you heard, he's only mentioned twice in the entire Bible, Nimrod. However, in the Book of the Upright, preserved by the Jews, which is absolutely fantastic, many of you know it as the Book of Jasher. It's got like 60 chapters, 60 chapters just on the life of Lugal Banda and Lugal Merit. Awesome. You know the same king, because he goes by another name. In the most ancient records, he went by Bilgamesh. <coughs> Babylonians changed the changed a few syllables, and all the history books now call him Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is seen in many ancient statues. We perceive him to be a giant because he holds two full-grown maned male lions, and they look like pussy cats to him. But this was normal for the times. The first generation. The first, I'm talking about the first generation. All the sons and daughters that were born to the Titans. And remember, the Titans are just normal humans that survived from the vapor canopy world. It doesn't, they didn't know that them being 12 to 15 feet tall was anything unordinary. They didn't understand. But humans born, their sons and daughters were also huge. First generation. The first generation of sons and daughters were huge too, but they were sons of the Titans. They weren't true Titans, and they were given the title of Gigantes. They were big people, but they weren't as tall, they weren't as strong. It was very quickly realized within 300 years after the vapor canopy that they didn't live as long either. Nimrod lived for 215 years, but his life was cut short. He was murdered. But he had it coming. He had already killed so many people. But uh, he was third generation. And you see how big he is in the text. He's the same person that's called Naram Sin on the steel of Naram Sin. You see a picture of him wearing that, that Pope-like hat, holding a, holding a weapon, and he's mowing over normal-sized humans. Those pictures aren't deifying somebody and making it bigger than they were. Those pictures are highly sophisticated. The symbols are sophisticated. The effigies are sophisticated. The messages they are conveying were very modern for the time period, and they're, they're actually depicting the, the true sizes of those people. We have proof of this in that the descendants of the Titans, called the Tamahu, are found on the Egyptian temples of Karnak. The Egyptian temples of Karnak have have depictions of all the different races that were known in ancient times. And the Tamahu were found. And they're gigantic. They're taller than everybody else. They're the sons, they, and they were called the sons of giants. But uh, in the Old Testament, we find Tamahu uh, uh, in the book of Numbers. And the Israelites are astonished because when they come up on the city of Anak and they see the Tamahu, they're like, oh my God, we're like grasshoppers to these people. How in the hell are we going to conquer these people? Little did they know the Phoenix was on the way. Those cities got 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 destroyed in earthquakes. Their walls and fortifications fell, and they they suffered uh, a fallout of stones, meteorites that scattered them and messed them off. And the Israelites were able to come in and, and do all kinds of shit. 
<laughs> they were able to conquer them people because of that because of that disaster. The year was 1411 BC, and I had subject for other videos too. I, I covered that in some of my videos. But but uh, Israelites defeated the giants during a phoenix cataclysm, the same way the descendants of the Israelites called the Tuatha Dei Danan, who were descended from the Danu, who had come from the from the from the, the carrying branch of the Israelite mariners called the, the tribe of Dan. They, are, they arrived in ancient Ireland in 1135 BC in the second battle of Moitura. The sun darkened and there was an earthquake and it brought terror to the fur bulbs who were giants. <coughs> and the Danan were allowed to conquer them in the second battle of Moitura. In the first battle of Moitura, the Danan, the Danan got their asses handed to them. They couldn't fight giants. So they waited a few more years and they knew by, by, by the calculations of their chronographers, they knew that the Phoenix phenomenon was about to occur. So they waited for it. And in the month of May, 1135 BC, the Danan invaded during during the Phoenix episode. They weren't scared because they already knew their prophets had prophesied that it was going to happen. So God was on their side. The same story is told over, over and over in the, in the Old Testament when the Israelites destroyed the Canaanites during a cataclysm. So, after the vapor canopy, the Titans are the survivors of the world before the flood. The Gigantes, the Giants, people like Gilgamesh and Nimrod, these people were born in the first, second, and third generation after the flood. But by the fourth generation after the flood, the pre-flood genetics was now purged. The vapor canopy genome was gone. There's no reason for it. People are living, and by the time of Abraham, it's already understood that people are only going to live about 145 years. By the time of Moses, they were living at 120 years, and that's where it's remained until this day. 120, 120 years seems to be the cap, but it, but it wasn't that way before. It's also said, it's also said in, in ancient Hermetic and, and Jewish tradition that 120 is one third of the old, of the old uh, lifespan cap, which means it was the expected life expectancy after the after the flood initially was 360 years. We see this is very interesting is because there are several people who are mentioned like Eber and Peleg and stuff who lived for over 400 years after the flood, but they were first generation, meaning their mom and their dad were both titans. They were both survivors of the flood. They were both born on the other side. So <coughs> they were let. They literally came from another world, not another planet, not another universe, not another, not another dimension. They came from a whole new world. They came from the vapor canopy world. That ecosphere was so different, so different. So, three and four hundred years after the flood, we have giants that are everywhere, and now normal humans are are being born at 100 times the rate. They had never seen anything like this. So 500, listen to this, this is very interesting right here. Excuse me, not 500, it's 360. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, it was uh, about 300, 350 to 300, I mean, 351 years after the flood, we had this, I, I was supposed to do a video on it, but I've been delayed, I haven't really got to it. It's called the Battle of Kurok-Sada. It is the Great War of ancient times. It was, it's phenomenal. It's mentioned in Genesis 14. The Great War involved normal humans, eight, an army of 800,000 normal-sized humans, taking on the last army of giants. The story is in Genesis chapter 14, but it's been sanitized. But you can see the elements in if you use a, if you use a lexicon in reading Genesis 14, you'll see how the English translators gloss over the fact that these are armies of Nephilim, Rephaim, Anakim, Ebim, Zamzums, gigantic peoples. Every one of these peoples are mentioned in the Old Testament. They are stated in the book of Numbers to be of heroic size and stature, the builders of ancient, gigantic, megalithic monuments. Uh, the five races were Rephaim, Anakim, Zuzum, Zamzumum, and Emim. Emim simply means terrors. These people were the descendants of the, of the Titans. And normal-sized humans had to take them out. They got tired of them. And the battle is called the Battle of Kuroksada. I'm going to give you the details. I'm going to do a full video on it. I'm also going to do a post in, in, in Facebook about it. But, but the reason Beowulf and the, the Epic of Gilgamesh and you know, the translations of N.K. Sanders and Maureen Gallery Kovacs, 
Kovacs, all these Sumerian scholars, man, who disagree with Zechariah Sitchin, but they have these also. They, I mean, they they do they do tra they do transliterate and, tra and translate texts that talk about giants. Giants were real. I've got four other videos on giants. Whole cities of giants have been found in northern Syria. It's called Bashan. But those books are being removed from our libraries. I can't even believe I found them. I found a book about Bashan. I posted it. I've got four other videos on giants, maybe five. This would really be the sixth. But the difference between Titans and Giants is because the vapor canopy collapsed. And the Titans were normal humans, just of gigantic size, still having babies. And for over a hundred years, all the babies they had ended up being the Gigantes, the Giants. This is why the Giants are always described as sons of the Titans. They were family members. They were just a whole different dynasty of families. And then after the Gigantes, the Giants themselves had, had children. And they were, they gave birth to the age of heroes. And it was many of these heroes like Jason and the Argonauts and uh, uh, Thestius and Perseus. Many of these heroes are in the Phoenix Legends. The Phoenix Legend of the Kraken and Joppa, man. That's a whole Phoenix Cataclysm in 1687 BC. Perseus was one of these sons of the giants. <coughs> anyway, I'm Jason of I hope it cleared up some of that for you. These are mis these are these this solves a great body of mysteries about the ancient world. Why the ancient texts are so adamant to describe to us races of titans and races of and races of giants and how they were different than humans and how humans ended up pretty much pretty much killing off the giants. Giants existed, but they were normal humans living in a different biosphere. One that they couldn't get used to. That's why they didn't stay gigantic. Their sons and daughters got smaller and smaller. But they had the more purified DNA of their of their parents. This is why different races of giants have been found. Because there were different races of titans. That means that during the vapor canopy world, there were blacks, whites, yellow, brown, red, whatever. I mean, there was all different types of humans during the vapor canopy world. They were just gigantic. Just like the animals were gigantic. The insects were gigantic. The trees were gigantic. The stars and planets were gigantic. It's a simulacrum though, remember, it's all optics. Now, that sums up this video, it's probably too long anyway. I'm, I'm on Lake Livingston right now, heading, going to my, def my destination. This is JasonOfArcades.com. I'm sorry guys, but the learning will never end. In the first two videos, we examined the 600 year period, the Anunnaki Nur chronology. We started at 5239 BC and ended 3000 years later at the Great Flood in 2239 BC. This is going to be a rather short video, but it's equally profound. We're going to continue on the 600 year thread and see where it takes us after the flood. In just two videos, I have provided you an abundance of sources that provide the dates of the 600 year periods. This Anunnaki Nur chronology of events maintains very definitive themes about gods, gods interacting and visiting men, of cataclysms, floods, the appearance of the moon, of heroes entering and exiting our history at these 600 year junctures, and of prophecy. Our analysis has thus far moved through history to the year of the Great Flood in 2239 BC, but we need to go further. I know the 600 year period is integral to our understanding of the coming unveiling, the apocalypse, and the historical events shaping our world today. But for you to know, it requires us to cover a lot more ground. As I have mentioned in many of my videos and in my published books, the greatest common denominator in the ancient writings of the world is the mention of races of giants. There are five different races of giants in the Old Testament. The controversies and the distinctions to, to be made between who are giants and who are titans and who are ordinary men. I cover these in prior videos, and it seems to be a theme of the Anunnaki Nur chronology. So moving on to 600 years after the flood, we arrived at something very peculiar. If you recall in our first two videos, 
The beginning and ending of Anunnaki neurochronology was determined by the birth of Abraham, 1947 BC, dated by many different ways. Now, we find 600 years after the flood, we find the death of Jacob, the patriarch later renamed Israel in his life. He dies at age 147 years old. Abram was born in 1947 years old, but he's 160 years old when Jacob was born, this being the year 1787 BC. Jacob lived 147 years. This gets us to the year 1640 or 1639 BC with the calendrical overlap. Now on his deathbed, Israel gives each of his individual sons prophecies about who they will become throughout history in the last days. This 1639 BC date is the year in many Jewish writings 2256 or 2256 Annus Mundi, the year of the world. This is very interesting. This chronological statement is also found on Wikipedia. It really shocked me re referencing Jewish studies. It says that Judah was born when Nimrod was the founder of Babel, you know of his Babylon, who died at, at 500 in the year 2256 Annus Mundi. And it says specifically right here, which was 600 years after the flood. So here is two different ways to date the 1639 BC death of Jacob and the inheritance of the prophetic futures of his sons who had become patriarchs of entire basically cultures that would turn into nations and later empires. Now, Stephen Jones, who I cite often because he has the most comprehensive chronology of the history of the world I have ever seen as far as uh, the biblical records are concerned, the Book of Jasher, Book of Jubilees, Assyrian eponyms, the Old Testament writings, he dates the death of Jacob at precisely 1639 B.C. Of further interest here is that Jacob's sons, the very ones who received the prophecies, the inheritance, the destinies, were involved themselves in a war against giants. And this is very thoroughly documented in, in old Talmudic writings and especially in about five different chapters in the book of Jasher. So it should come as no surprise to us that this 600 year great year period of the Anunnaki, 600 years after the flood was 1639 BC, death of Jacob, but counting another 600 years, we have in the Bible chronologically lining up perfectly as also noted by Stephen Jones in Secrets of Time, 600 years after the death of Jacob, in 1039 BC, David was born, the future giant slayer. The video you see right here explains that history and how David and his men actually killed more than one giant. He didn't just fight Goliath, they killed five giants and the archaeological discoveries of the giant cities of Bashan can be seen in this video. I have actually five different videos on giants. As many of you know, there is no culture in antiquity more fascinated and fixated whose, whose prehistories were more entwined with giants than the ancient Greeks. And this leads us to our next Anunnaki nerve 600 years from the birth of the giant slayer, David. We have the dedication of one of the most popular and famous Greek examples of architecture from the old world, the Parthenon. Seven or eight years of construction, the Parthenon was dedicated in the year 439 BC, before it was even open to the public in 432 BC. Now, the Parthenon housed the statue of Athena, sculpted by Phidias in Athens, Greece, the center of Greekdom. To the east, the most religiously important side of the monument was a theme that was of the sculpture uh, Metopes. 
This is called the Gigantomachy. Some people call it the Titanomachy. And in Greek mythology, the Titanomachy was a 10-year series of battles that were fought, consisting mostly of titans fighting against the Olympians, who were the gods and their allies. This event was known as the War of the Titans. Sound familiar? To the Greeks, the history of the gods and the history of men collided with the end of the age of the gods in a ten-year-long war that we know of as the Trojan War. It is a theme in the early Greek writings that the Trojan War actually began the Greek historical period, which is unusual because this ten years was, for, was actually from 1239 to 1229 BC, shortly after the Battle of the Seven against Thebes. This was an Israelite battle. I have a video about it. As soon as the Greek culture began out of the ashes of older Mycenaean, Hittite, Minoan, Danan, and Ionian blood, suddenly, just right after the Trojan War began, a 400-year-long Mediterranean Dark Age occurred. The Phoenix visited and wrought a terrible destruction. This is why the epic works of Theognis, of Hesiod, and of Homer all recorded events four and five centuries before the 8th, 7th centuries BC when they lived and wrote. We have in the Parthenon an architectural relic that gives off an indirect reference to the Anunnaki nerve period. This is profound that the Titanomachy involves all the elements that we find in these 600 year periods spanning through history. But what's further profound is that the very person of Noah in the ancient Greek Nereus, Ner being the root word for the Sumerian time of 600 years, is found in Nereus. And Nereus is found on the Parthenon. And there has even been researchers and scholars who have published books about this. So here is a chart demonstrating what we have learned in three videos. It is subdivided into historical sections, as you can see at the top of the chart, the beginning of the simulacrum, then the pre-flood vapor canopy world, then ancient to classical history or antiquity, then the late classical to the modern world. This is the first eight Anunnaki nerve periods of 600 years each from 5239 BC to the dedication of the Parthenon in 439 BC. This chart should help you understand just how unusual this timeline is. Very definitive. And remember, I didn't date these events. The first three dates you see in gray in white letters 5239 BC is year one of the Anunnaki chronology. Then 4039, oh no, excuse me, 4639 BC, the Nemesis Cataclysm, the binary system is destroyed. Now, 600 years later is 4039 BC, which is the capture flood. The moon arrives from the Nemesis system, is captured in our orbit. It brings the Anuna to this world. Now, these are in gray because they are dated by extrapolation. Meaning, we have so many dates like 3439 BC, 2839 birth of Noah, 2239 great flood, and the three dates that we just covered in this video, all at 600 year intervals, it is an easy matter to go back in time 600 years each to date those events for which we have many traditions and records for, but we don't have actual calendrical, like a chrono marker. So those are in gray. The black and yellow you see on the chart are actual dates dated by many different references. As I've, as I've showed in these three videos, none of them dated by me. So the Anunnaki Nur chronology, year 1, 5239 BC, we really don't know what happened that year to begin the chronology. Not from just this analysis. Again, in 4639 BC, the nemesis Cataclysm occurs. Our binary collapses. The solar system is destroyed. Earth, Phoenix, Nemesis X object, the dark satellite, and our moon are objects that are hurled out in space, but they're trapped in the gravity well of another star, our binary. But more details on this later. Then the 3439 BC Gihon flood centrally in Egypt, kills a third of mankind. The Anuna appear with great technology to rebuild civilization. Their leader is Enki. In the historical record, he becomes Enoch. Now, 
This is 432,000 days before the Great Flood, or two 600-year periods under the 360-day draconian calendar, the uh, Alpha Draconis calendar of the pre-flood vapor canopy world. So 600 years after that, we have also in the Bible the birth of, I mean, the death of Jacob, who is renamed Israel, who passes on the prophecies and destinies and futures to Joseph, but Joseph already received an inherit, his inheritance, so his sons get to carry that legacy, Ephraim and Manasseh. But this is a subject of other videos. 600 years after that, we have David, the giant slayer born, who later becomes king of Israel. 439 BC is 600 years later with the Greeks building the Parthenon, which is dedicated to the Titanomachy, the War of the Titans and Giants, which has hidden among the sculptures a bust of Nerus. Nerus being the Anunnaki Ner personified into the person of the flood survivor Noah. Much of this is covered in my published book, Return of the Fallen Ones, Nephilim Histories, the Antediluvian World, Anunnaki Chronology, and the Coming Cataclysm. So in this short video, we have documented a 600-year timeline of events from 5239 BC to 4039 BC. We have moved from ancient pre-flood history to late antiquity, 439 BC. But now, our study of the chronology of the old world requires us to move backwards through history from 439 BC back through every single 138 year Phoenix visitation. What we will find when comparing the Anunnaki Nerd dates and the events with the 138 year recorded appearances of the Phoenix is both shocking and very instructive. What's important to remember here is that this 600 year timeline and the Phoenix dates themselves are not derived from my own uh, imagination. They are strictly from others' research, ancient books and monuments. I'm merely reconstructing facts that were already extant before I was born. Giants on Ancient Earth, an in-depth study on the Nephilim is a paperback and an ebook that I wrote after many years of exhaustive research on the Nephilim. This work is over 320 pages packed with data on giants, ancient texts, and little known histories concerning the races of gigantic peoples that once lived on this rock, and the establishment censorship employed to silence news on these modern discoveries. Writing of events before his own time when he finished his monumental book, The Histories, about 440 BC, Herodotus wrote that an excavation of what was believed to be a crypt from a Trojan hero called Orestes yielded forth the remains of a human giant who had stood ten foot tall. This book of world history was written over 24 centuries ago and it will be shown in this work. It is but only one of multitudes of ancient texts that mention a historic race of giants. In 170 AD, Athenagoras wrote, the book of angels and giants. It was the accepted history of the time and had been for two millennia when wicked angels long ago before the deluge copulated with human females who then gave birth to monstrous giants. These angels were gods, jinn, demons, fairies, each culture painting them with their own brush. Only later did official Christianity stamp out the belief by declaring it pagan, similarly, similarly to how the modern scientific community censors all discoveries concerning giants from the public domain. After the Romans conquered Jerusalem in 135 AD, the rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai led Hadrian into the deep underground catacombs beneath the temple. He was shown the bones of enormous men who had stood over nine feet tall and was told that they were ancient Amorites. About the same time, over 17 centuries ago, Sertorius in Spain was shown the crypt of a giant named Antaeus, the skeletal remains of a man who stood six cubits high. This measures to a height of 108 inches, or 9 feet. It was during Hadrian's reign, sea waves at Rothium washed open an ancient tomb containing a giant skeleton. Its kneecaps were the size of large discs. Hadrian ordered that the bones be reburied. In 240 AD, Manny the Persian wrote the Book of Giants, a text not to be confused with the Dead Sea Scrolls text of the exact same name that is almost three centuries older. 
Manny was a religious reformer, but he was killed by the religious authorities of his time. He believed that Christianity had become corrupted by the influence of Judaism. He founded the Gnostic sect of Manichaeism. Manny may have derived much of his material from the various writings in circulation at the time attributed to Enoch. This text explores our, this work. Some of the more unusual information from ancient writings have now been verified in chance find. In the Babylonian Talmud called the Barakthoth, we learn that giants before the flood had a double row of teeth. Such large human skeletons have now been found that prominently exhibit these double rows of teeth. In 1822 at Lompcock Rancho, California, soldiers excav excavated among carved shells, huge stone axes, and blocks of porphyry adorned in an unknown script containing the skeleton of a man who once stood 12 feet tall with a double row of teeth. Later, more gigantic human skeletons were found with double dentition inside a mound near Clearwater, Minnesota. In 1872 at Seneca Township, Ohio, were excavated three human skeletons 8 feet tall with double rows of teeth. In 1880, giant skeletons with double rows of teeth, hyperdontia, were found in Clearwater, Minnesota. In 1892, a gigantic human skeleton was found with a double row of teeth in Proctorville, Ohio. The ancient race of giants occupying Ireland of old, called the Fomori, also had a double row of teeth. More will be discussed on the Fomori later in this work. <clears throat> even, today, <clears throat> even today, there are people born with hyperdontia. <clears throat> this genetic increase of anatomical traits is also found in Nephilim studies in the six-fingered and six-toed skeletal remains unique to gigantic human skeletons. In 1891, in Crittenden, Arizona, was discovered a stone sarcophagus of a giant who once stood about 12 feet, having six fingers and six toes on his hands and feet, according to the carving of the giant on the stone. In 1895, a 12-foot-tall fossilized giant was found in County Antrim, Ireland. It had six toes on its right foot. In 1949, in New Zealand, it is reported that gigantic human footprints with six toes were discovered in volcanic ash, petrified, giants once standing at least 12 feet tall. At Tiwanaku in South America were excavated statues of great age, with men having six fingers on their hands and six toes on their feet. In the area of Braystown, near the headwaters of the Tennessee River, were found fossilized footprints of six-toed human giants, one being monstrous, the heel impression 13 inches wide. Petroglyphs found near Three Rivers, New Mexico, are with hands that had six fingers. A strong link between the official censorship between Nephilim discoveries and extraterrestrial UFO studies has been noted by many researchers. In May of 1947, a six-fingered alien was autopsied on film. The extraterrestrial body said to have been taken from the UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico. This case is famous and only mentioned here because of the obvious correlation to six-fingered specimens. But the censorship is relevant. In 1999, a washout unearthed human skeletons about seven foot tall with six fingers and six toes on their limbs with huge teeth but no canines. Extra-large molars and incisors Large skulls, larger than proportional eye sockets and fingers, too long for such small hands. Skeletons had been buried with beautiful pottery and baskets of fine weave. They were unearthed at Arizona's Canyon de, de Chelly National Monument. All park personnel were pressed into service as government agents arrived at the location to box up the artifacts and the remains as they were directly overseen by personnel from the Smithsonian Institute and FBI who conducted full body searches. All involved were forced to sign non-disclosure secrecy documents. Extra teeth, extra fingers and toes, and now this. In 1899 near New Mexico was an earth a human skeleton having two extra ribs, 26 ribs in all. The whole human race has 24 ribs. How did this happen? Sorry, folks, this is a teaser. Giants on Ancient Earth quotes from over 140 sources, not including the hundreds of citations in the biblical books. Many of these sources, being out-of-print texts other Nephilim researchers are completely unaware of. If your interest is in the Nephilim, in the, the biblical Old Testament story of the Anakim and the Rephaim, the Ezim, the Emims, the Zumims, the Zamzumims, uh, the, the pedigree of Goliath, then I suggest you read Giants on Ancient Earth. It's available on Amazon. I've kept it as cheap as I can. 
Uh, I've had some really favorable reviews on this book, and I hope you I hope you do enjoy it.